Howdy folks! Here's a short video on applications of Lagrange's theorem. I hope you enjoy. You ready to have some fun? Let's do it. Recall that if H is a subgroup of G and X is an element of G, then the right coset of H determined by X is the following set. We write H then X and it's exactly the set of elements in G of the form h times x, where little h is running through the subgroup h. So this is a subset of G, but it's not necessarily a subgroup. In fact, it'll only be a subgroup when the element x is in the subgroup h. We write G mod h, g with a slash that's supposed to sort of remind us of division, for the set of all right cosets of H. Okay, and then the index of H in G is the cardinality of this set. It's the number of right cosets. So in symbols, we write the index this way. We write g colon h. And remember, it's exactly the size of this set of cosets. OK, so it's the number of different right cosets. Since these right cosets, as we saw before, these are exactly the orbits for the left translation action of the subgroup h on g, we know that these right cosets partition the entire group G. So there's some number of right cosets, and the index is exactly the number of them, the number of cosets in this partition. Great. Okay, so now let's recall the statement of Lagrange's theorem. It says the following. If G is a finite group, H is a subgroup of G, then the order of G is equal to the order of H times the index of H in G. That's the statement of Lagrange's theorem. It justifies this notation G divided by H for the number of cosets because the index, the size of the set of right cosets, the number of total right cosets that there are, it's exactly the size of G divided by the size of H. So that's another way of saying what Lagrange's theorem says. So here's an immediate important consequence. We'll use this all the time. An important consequence is that the order of any subgroup of G divides the order of G, right? The size of a group, its cardinality, is called its order. And so the size of any subgroup divides the size of the entire group. The order of any subgroup divides the order of G. OK, let's look at a more specific corollary that is a special case of that consequence. Remember, a corollary is just a statement that follows immediately from a theorem. So this is a corollary of Lagrange's theorem. If G is a finite group and X is an element of G, then the order of that element divides the size of the group, the order of G. Why is this a corollary? Well, by definition, the order of X is the order of the cyclic subgroup it generates. 
right? If we look at all of the powers of x, taking x to the first power, x squared, x cubed, and so on, the order of x is precisely the number of elements in G that are uh, generated by such powers of x, including the identity element. It's a finite group. Some power of x will give us the identity element. And the total number of those elements is the order of x. But since that cyclic subgroup is a subgroup, we can apply Lagrange's theorem to it. So since the cyclic subgroup generated by x is a subgroup of G, by Lagrange's theorem, its size, the size of that subgroup, divides the size of G. I write this vertical bar for divides. And so, and that gives us the corollary, the size of the subgroup, that's precisely the order. So the order of any element divides the order of the group. This gives us restrictions immediately on the possible orders of elements in a finite group. So for example, let's suppose that we have a finite group and let's say it has 12 elements. Since 12 is 4 times 3, we know all of the divisors of 12. And since the orders of the elements in G must divide the order of G, this tells us that the possible orders of elements in this group, whatever it is, are as follows. Well, they're all of the divisors of 12. What are those? We have 1, we have 2, we have 3, we have 4, we don't have 5, we have 6, and we have 12. So those six numbers, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, and 12, those are the only possible orders of elements in this group. All right. And this kind of reasoning can go both ways. Suppose that a group contains elements of specified orders. So suppose G is a finite group containing an element of order, let's say, 5, and an element of order 11. Well, since those two orders, 5 and 11, must both divide the order of the group, the size of the group, it follows that the size of the group, the order of the group, must be divisible by both 5 and 11. In other words, it must be divisible by 55. In other words, that means that G, the order of G, is a multiple of 55. So the group might have order 55, it might have order 110, and so on. All of the multiples of 55, those are possibilities for the size of the group in such a scenario. But I want to I wanna get you to try being creative on Canvas, just to take your time and, and sit down and have nothing in mind when you start. Just have a good feeling and be happy and, and in love with life and your world and, and sit down and begin playing. And if you feel good about yourself and the world, it'll show in your painting and all these little things will happen. Here's the next corollary of Lagrange's theorem. And this corollary is uh, the classification of groups of prime order. That's a fancy way of saying what we're about to state. So suppose that the order of G, its size, is a prime number P. So P is a uh, 
positive integer. That's a prime number. Then any non-identity element in this group is a generator. If you take any element in this group that's not the identity element, it must be a generator. And if you have a single generator, then you're a cyclic group. So G is cyclic, since it has a generator. Any non-identity element will serve as a generator. So in particular, G is cyclic. And since all cyclic groups of the same order are isomorphic, it's isomorphic to the particular cyclic group of order P, the integers modulo P. So that's the classification of groups with a prime number of elements. They must be a cyclic group of that size. They must be isomorphic to the integers modulo p. All right, uh, how does this follow from Lagrange's theorem? Well, given an element of G that's not the identity element, as in the statement of the corollary, we know by the previous corollary that the order of that element x must divide the order of the group, which is p. And now we're going to use the fact that p is a prime number. What are the possible divisors of a prime number? By definition, the only positive integers that divide p are 1 and p. If that order happens to be 1, then it has to be the identity element. And we assumed that this was not the case. That's impossible. That's absurd. That would be a contradiction. And so therefore, the order of x must in fact be p. And that means, uh, by definition, that the cyclic subgroup generated by x, which has size p by definition of the order, that cyclic subgroup generated by x must be the entire group, right? To say that the order of x is p is exactly to say that this subgroup generated by x has size p. And since g has p elements, that means that these are equal. Well, that's what it means for x to be a generator. Thus, x is a generator of g. And in particular, G is cyclic. So that proves the corollary. All groups of prime order are cyclic. That's the name of the game. It's enjoying. You really already enjoy what you do in life. If you do, then you'll do a good job. Mm. And I certainly enjoy what I'm doing. We now suppose that we have a finite group whose order is n, not necessarily a prime number, just some positive integer. And x is an element of g. The conclusion is that if we multiply x by itself n times, we have to get the identity element. So if you raise any element of a finite group to the power given by the size of that group, you'll get back to the identity element. Why does this follow from Lagrange's theorem? In the following way, uh, since the order of this element x, whatever it is, it could be 1, it could be uh, the entire size of the group if it's a cyclic group generated by x, whatever it is, that order divides the size of the group, which we said was n. So since the order of x divides n, there must be some integer k, some positive integer k, for which k times the order of x is equal to n. That's just what division means. So k is the quotient. It's n divided by the order. And now, what does that give us? If we take x to the nth power and then write that n as k times the order of x, well then, using our exponent rules, that's the same thing as x raised 
to the order of x raised to the kth power. But if you take x to its order, right, by definition, that order, it's the size of the cyclic subgroup it generates. It's exactly the first power of x that returns you to the identity. So that term in parentheses is the identity element. That's the definition of the order of x. x raised to the order of x is the identity. So we get e to the k, but that's just e. Multiply the identity any number of times together, and it'll be the identity element still. So there's the proof of the corollary. Let's put it back on screen. Again, if uh, you have some finite group, then any element raised to the size of that group is the identity element. Painting should make you happy. If it does nothing else, it should make you happy. And if it doesn't make you happy, <laughs> you're doing the wrong thing. Because it's fun. And if you can do things all of your life that make you happy, needless to say, you're going to be a happy person. Let's see a consequence of this corollary that any element of a finite group raised to the order of the group gives you the identity element. Let's suppose we're working with a finite group of order 32. Notice the 32, that's 2 to the fifth, right? So that means that as a first observation, any x in g satisfies the equation x raised to the 32nd power is the identity, all right? That's just a restatement of the corollary in the particular case where n is 32. But now let's suppose that g is not cyclic. So if g is not cyclic, then no element has order 32, right? In other words, since no element is a generator of the group, no element has order th 32, we have the following uh, possibilities for orders. If x is an element of g, the order of x has to divide 32, but it can't be equal to 32. So what are the possibilities for the orders of elements in this non-cyclic group of order 32? And they gotta be all of the divisors of 32. These are just the powers of two up to, but not including 32. So the only possibilities for the orders of x are one, two, four, eight, and 16. If you have a non-cyclic group of order 32, all the elements gotta have order one of those five numbers. In particular, this might not seem obvious at first, but it's a consequence of this, that last statement. Every element in G, if it's a not a cyclic group, satisfies the equation x to the 16 is equal to the identity element, right? We said before that this equation, x to the 32 equals the identity element. That's always satisfied in this group, even if it is a cyclic group. But under the additional information that g is not cyclic, since the order of all the elements have to be 1, 2, 4, 8, or 16, well, those are all divisors of 16. They divide evenly into 16. And so every element raised to the 16th power is the identity. It's a good day to be alive. <laughs> Come to think of it, every day is a good day to be alive. Okay, next up, let's recall the center of a group. The center of a group is the following subgroup. We denote it by z of g, and it's exactly the set of all elements in g that commute with all other elements. So it's the set of elements x and g satisfying the equation x times y equals y times x for all other elements y and g. That's the center. All right. Also note that this means that the center of a group is equal to the entire group if and only if, I'll write IFF for if and only if, logical equivalence. That's true if and only if every element commutes with every other element. In other words, G is abelian.
that's just a way to say that G is abelian. The center of the group is the entire group. All right, we're going to see another uh, more clever application of Lagrange's theorem. Here we go. Let's now suppose that the order of our group, the size of our group, is the square of a prime. Before we had the classification of groups of prime order, where the order of G was P, but now we're going to assume that the order of G is P squared, where P is a prime number. Next up, we're going to assume that the center of G contains at least one non-identity element. In other words, we're going to assume that the size of the center is bigger than 1. Okay. Um, under this assumption, we're going to prove that G, in fact, must be abelian. The center must be the entire group. And now, before we give the proof of this proposition, let me make a brief little remark. In a few weeks, we will see that this assumption about the size of the center is actually superfluous. It turns out that the center of G is, in fact, bigger than 1. We don't need this hypothesis for any group whose order is a power of a prime. So if the order of G is P to the n for some n, then the center always contains some non-identity element. So we don't actually need that assumption, uh, but we don't yet know this result in the remark. We'll see it in a couple weeks. So uh, we're going to make that part of the assumptions of the proposition for now. OK, let's go ahead and prove the proposition. All righty. So how are we going to use Lagrange's theorem? Well. Lagrange's theorem says that the size of every subgroup is a divisor of the size of the group. In particular, the center being a subgroup of the group G, its possible orders are the divisors of P squared. What are the divisors of P squared? They're 1, P, and P squared. Those are the only numbers which divide P squared because P is a prime number. Right. Um, now we know that the first possibility is no good because of our assumption. Right? We know that the center has at least one non-identity element, so its size is bigger than one. And on the other hand, if we look at the other extreme, where the size of the center is p squared, well, in that case, the center having the same number of elements as the entire group would be equal to the entire group. So if the center has p squared elements, then the center is in fact the entire group G. And so in that case, G is abelian. That's what we want to prove. So in other words, uh, this possibility is ruled out. The case where the center only has a single element, just by assumption. And in this other possibility, where it has p squared elements, we get what we want. We have, we've you know, it just means, because the center is the whole group, that G is abelian. So the only other possibility is P, and let's just consider that. So next we assume that the center has order P. That's the only other possibility to consider. And now let's let X be some element of the group that's not in the center. Right? Since the size of the center is p, it's not the entire group, so we can find some element x that's not in the center. Okay. Now, here's the part of the proof where we actually have to do something clever. We have to consider yet another subgroup of g that depends on x, and that is the centralizer of x. So let's recall that. Let's recall the definition of the centralizer of an element x in a group. We denote that by C subscript G of X. That's just the notation for the centralizer. What is it? 
it is by definition the set of elements y in the group that commute with x. It looks a lot like the definition of the center, but it's a little bit different. In the center, we just consider all elements which satisfy this equation for any y. This is different. We pick an x, it's fixed, and then we consider the set of elements y that commute with x. So the centralizer is the set of elements in the group that commute with x. This is a subgroup. Okay. So centralizer is a subgroup of G. That's always the case. Um, it follows from the fact that it's a stabilizer of the element X under the conjugation action. And stabilizers are always subgroups, so that's one way to see that it's a subgroup, but you can also just check by hand. If you have uh, some two elements Y and Y prime in the centralizer, then their product will also be in the centralizer. It's not too hard to check that. And it's also obvious that the identity element satisfies this equation, right? If I replace y by e, that equation will hold. The identity element always commutes with x. So this is a subgroup of g. All right. Now also note that the center is always a subgroup of the centralizer. All right, that might take a little bit more thought. Why is that? Well, if y commutes with everything, that's what we would mean for y to be in the center. If it commutes with everything, then y commutes with x. All right, x is an element of the group. So if you commute with everything, then in particular you commute with x. So that proves that anything in the center is also in the centralizer. Okay, next up, how are we gonna finish this proof? Remember, we're trying to prove that g is abelian right now. And we've assumed that the center has p elements. Well, let's apply Lagrange's theorem to the centralizer. The centralizer of x, it's also a subgroup, and so since the group has p squared elements, its size must be one p or p squared. But we know that the size of the center is p. That was just our assumption. So right now we were assuming that the center had p elements. We were under that assumption. And since the centralizer contains the center, which has p elements, the size of the centralizer has got to be at least p. So one is not a possibility. Uh, so thus, the centralizer has at least p elements. But in fact, it has more. How do we know that? I claim that x is always an element of the centralizer. Why is that? Because, well, if you write x times x, that's just x squared. That's the same thing as x times x. I'm sort of thinking of uh, the two copies of x as being different. The point is x commutes with x, right? What was the definition of the centralizer? It was the set of elements that commute with x. x certainly satisfies this equation. x commutes with x. x commutes with x, and so x is in the centralizer. On the other hand, uh, we assumed, that's where we got this element x in the first place, we assumed that x was not in the center. So the centralizer has at least p elements, but here's a new element in the centralizer that's not in the center. That's where those first p elements comes, came from. So in fact, the centralizer <coughs> has at least p plus one elements. It has all of the elements in the center plus this new element x. So in fact, this is too small. The, center, the centralizer cannot have p elements because it has at least p plus one elements. And so the only possibility for the centralizer is p squared. Okay, but what does that mean? <clears throat> 
if you have p squared elements, that's the order of the group. That means the centralizer of x is the entire group. Right? We're assuming g has p squared elements. That means that every element commutes with x. Right? The definition of the centralizer, the centralizer is all of the elements that commute with x. If the centralizer is the entire group, that means that every element commutes with x. Every element in G commutes with x. That's just the definition of the centralizer. The centralizer was the set of elements that commute with x. If that's the whole group, then every element commutes with x. And so by definition, x is in the center, right? The center was the set of elements that commute with everything. And we're saying that every element commutes with x. And so x commutes with everything. x is in the center. Oh, wait. That's a contradiction. We assumed that x was not in the center. So that's a contradiction. What does it contradict? What was the assumption we made that this is a contradiction to? It was this contradiction. Excuse me, it was this assumption, that the order of the center was p. Remember, we went through the possibilities for the center. We saw that 1 was not a possibility, because we were assuming that it has at least one element. And if the center has p squared elements, g must be abelian. That's great. And so we were considering this possibility, and we've reached a conclusion. A contradiction. Excuse me. We've reached a contradiction. We can't have p elements in the center. It's got to have p squared elements. And so we can conclude that the size of the center, in fact, must be p squared. And thus, g is abelian. Awesome. So as a special case, we get this claim I made earlier on in the course that uh, if g has order 169, 13 squared, and the superfluous assumption that we'll see later, in fact, always follows, uh, that g has a non identity element in the center, meaning that the size of the center is bigger than 1, then g is abelian. That's a special case of this proposition.